You're tuning in to the Black Hollywood Live Network, featuring news, interviews, and commentary on all things Black Hollywood. Hollywood redefined. From Los Angeles, California, presented by Maria Menounos and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies. This is Black Hollywood Live. Justice is served. Featuring the week's roundup and commentary on legal news. Black Hollywood Live. Hollywood redefined. You're listening to Black Hollywood Live. And now, the host for Black Hollywood Live, Justice is served. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Justice is Served, the show where we give you all of the latest in legal news. I am your host, Mari Fagel. I am joined by my lovely co-host, Rawa gebre Ab, and a special guest in studio with us today, Lisa Bloom, legal analyst and author of the new book, Suspicion Nation. Uh, the book is all about the inside story of the trial of George Zimmerman. So Lisa, I am so happy to have you on today because we have been discussing this trial really from the beginning on this show. Uh, so reading this book was very fascinating well, for me. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, Lisa, I want to talk about some of your points in the book, especially about the prosecution, because to me that was the most interesting because you know, let me know if I'm wrong, but do you think the prosecution really fumbled this case and that this was a winnable case lost, as you said? Well, you're right on both of those counts. So I covered this trial for NBC News and MSNBC, gavel to gavel, very extensively. And as I did, I was so concerned that I saw a case that was being handled very differently from any of the other many trials I've covered over the last 20 years as a legal analyst covering every major case or as a trial lawyer myself for the last 28 years. And what was different was the witnesses seemed to be unprepared, the best evidence that the prosecution had. They didn't seem to be arguing. They didn't call very basic expert witnesses that they should have called. They made a closing argument that was a series of questions rather than declarative statements connecting the law to the facts. And so when the trial was over, well, first of all, I knew it was going to be an acquittal, and I said so on the air before that happened. After the acquittal, you know, I had this feeling in my gut, just like many people, that there was an injustice here. But I didn't want to just rely on my gut. I wanted to know exactly what happened. I wanted to know what the facts were. So I did my own investigation of jurors, of witnesses, uh, talking to attorneys, all kinds of people involved in the case. And the result, as you say, is my book, Suspicion Nation. And the bottom line is, it's even worse than I had suspected. I mean, it, the fumbles by the prosecution, the terrible errors that they and the police made, in a very real sense, Trayvon Martin was put on trial, and Trayvon Martin did not get a fair trial. Now, I want to talk about one instance that you think the prosecution really missed, and you talk about how you did your own investigation. Basically, George Zimmerman's story was that Trayvon Martin was on top of him, and Trayvon Martin was reaching underneath for his gun, which was located on his back, right. and at that point, he pulled the gun out, and he shot Trayvon Martin. You got it. Uh, is that possible, or <laughs> is that, in your words, impossible. So that was my aha moment when I was covering the trial. I went back in the evening and reviewed the evidence myself as I would if I were an attorney trying the case and I saw this videotape where George Zimmerman a day after the shooting demonstrated as you say where the gun was holstered and you know it was this moment where I had to stop rewind play stop rewind play I had to watch it about 20 times and I had to get other people around me to watch it because I couldn't believe my own eyes but there it was George Zimmerman demonstrating the gun was holstered not only inside the waistband of his pants but behind him with his shirt and jacket over it and he says that he was on his back and Trayvon Martin was on top of him. Well, unless Trayvon Martin had x-ray vision, there is no way he could have seen through the bulk of Zimmerman's body to a gun holstered behind him. And when you add to At that, it was a in the very rain. dark <laughs> night, it was raining, and there was grass on the ground. It just makes his story impossible. And I thought to myself, if the prosecution is missing that, what else are they missing in the case? And so, you know, I went to the crime scene in Sanford, Florida. I saw that where the incident happened was a substantial distance from the concrete, for example. Uh, Zimmerman also claimed that Trayvon Martin had banged his head on the concrete. The concrete was Trayvon Martin's deadly weapon. And indeed, it could be a deadly weapon if this incident happened near the concrete, which it didn't. 
So yeah. that was another key point that the prosecution missed. And so I tell that story in the book. I tell the story of Rachel Gentel, the young woman who was on the phone with Trayvon Martin, who was so mishandled by the prosecution and not prepared to testify. She should have been the most important witness in the case. But the jury completely ignored her testimony because she was so unprepared. I'd, I'd like to touch on, on Rachel Gentel because I found her to be such a compelling figure uh, during the trial. Uh, I mean, there were so many different aspects to her testimony. I mean, at one point, I think some would deem her, have deemed her combative, and then at other times, uh, unsure and, and not being able to keep her story straight. Um, I think what was clear to many was that she was very, um, still very emotionally distraught by the death of her friend since she was the last person uh, that knew him, that spoke with him, yeah. and uh, before, before his passing, before Trayvon's passing. Uh, I'd be curious to know I mean, what should the prosecution have done and how should they have prepared her for, uh, to, to present better? So, I, you know, I was so pleased to be able to talk to Rachel and mm -hmm. to tell her story in the book, most of which people just have no idea because it hasn't been told before. First of all, prosecutors uh, pr pr put on witnesses every day in America who are criminals, who are drug dealers, who are gang members, who have mm -hmm. mental health issues, who don't speak English well, who have prior perjury convictions. Rachel was none of those. Uh, she was simply a 19-year-old girl who was nervous about testifying in the highest profile case in America mm -hmm. and who needed some preparation. And yeah, she had some emotion. This was her friend. This is the first person she had ever known who had died. And one of the things Rachel said that I quote in the book is, I don't do death. You know, this is a young woman who had no experience with this, and it was highly traumatic for her. Mm -hmm. So be very simple. If this were me, if this were my witness, I would I'd take her into the courtroom one day when court's not in session, maybe on a Saturday. You put her up on the witness stand. You put the microphones in front of her, because most people are very uncomfortable talking in microphones right. if they're not practiced at mm -hmm. it. You stand in the back of the courtroom, and you say, okay, Rachel, I'm going to do some practice with you. You know, maybe she says, I don't want to. You know, Rachel, I need you to do this for Trayvon. Can you mm -hmm. do this for Trayvon? Oh, okay, yes, I can, all right? Then you go over it with her. Now, we also know now that I reveal in the book, she had an underbite, which is a medical condition, correctable by surgery. It's nothing to do with credibility. That should have been pointed out to the jury, and they could practice with her to speak clearly. Um, none of that happened, and so she testified very poorly, and many of the jurors said she had no credibility because she was a poor communicator. You know, the, the good news is, that Rachel now is a straight A student. Mm -hmm. She's headed off to college. I think she has a bright future ahead of her. She's gotten some help from tutors and from adults who, whose heart, hearts went out to her. Yes. She's a bright young woman. Mm -hmm. She could have done very well. And I, I tell the story in the book of what she would have testified to if she had been prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important bits of that is that this was a very lighthearted conversation she was having on the phone with Trayvon Martin right. as he saw Tr uh, George Zimmerman. Yes, he was afraid of George Zimmerman, but then Zimmerman disappeared, and then they were joking around. Mm -hmm. You know, This was not a homicidal maniac waiting to jump out and kill George Zimmerman, and that's the way he depicted Trayvon. Right. I want to ask you again about Rachel Gentel because everyone watching that testimony and especially that cross-examination with Don West had very strong feelings. Yes. Either they thought that she was being disrespectful, that she was being rude, or they thought that Don West was being too aggressive with her and that he was belittling her because of her race and because of her education level and who she was. Uh, and it was interesting to me because I did a piece on Huffington Post this summer, uh, a debate about Rachel Gentel. And mm. I really said that Don West didn't treat her any differently than he would have treated any other witness on the mm -hmm. stand who he wanted to contradict their story. He was a tough cross examiner and it didn't matter the color of her skin. Do you agree? Um, I agree in part. You know, in my book, I'm highly critical of the prosecution and the state of Florida because the defense did exactly what we would expect them to do. Uh, these were highly skilled defense attorneys. Of course they're going to cross-examine every witness as, as much as possible. The prosecution is the one in this case that failed to do their job. So Don West, the, uh, the, the defense attorney, did cross-examine her very extensively for about five hours, I think. The prosecution should have been on their feet on a number of occasions and objected to the repetitive questioning, the questioning going off onto tangents that were highly irrelevant. And this judge indicated that she would rein people in when they were going on and on or going off in tangents. She had done that many times. So why didn't they do that for Rachel Gentel? That's a question that the prosecution has to answer. You know, questioning her about how a meeting was set up 
or you know just these really minor details that were not significant that was to be entirely expected now you raised the issue of race and i think race it was a very important factor in this case also bungled by the prosecution the defense was very comfortable with the issue of race and they argued a very illogical point but they argued it very comfortably and that is they said that there had been burglars in the neighborhood who were African-American. Trayvon Martin was African-American. Therefore, it was fair for George Zimmerman to be concerned about him. Well, first of all, just as a matter of pure logic, that is uh, completely false. That's what we call a false syllogism in logic. And I go through in the book of why that is, right? So that's like saying 95% of housekeepers are female. You are female. There, I'm, go I'm going to assume you're a housekeeper, right? It's that same kind of faulty logic. Um, but taking just the, the logic part out of it, it was also highly offensive. And the prosecution should have been on their feet every time that analogy was made to say, what does this have to do with Trayvon Martin? He was not a criminal. He had no criminal history. And to attribute the wrongs of a couple of African Americans, the burglars who had been in the neighborhood six months prior, to all African Americans is the very definition of racism. With Rachel Gentel in particular, uh, she used a couple of words that were racially inflammatory, like cracka and like N-I-G-G-A. Okay, that could have been explained. And she wanted to explain what the words meant when she and Trayvon used them in conversation. Uh, he had said that George Zimmerman was a creepy ass cracka, right? And she said, no, but let me explain. And then the prosecution cut her off. Uh, that was unfortunate. She should have been allowed to explain that this is kind of teenage lingo, especially N-I-G-G-A in reference to George Zimmerman is not a racial term. It's more equivalent to dude or guy or homie in the way that young people talk. Uh, the jurors were actually speaking out loud in the jury box when she said that. What did, what did she say? What is, is that racist? What is that? And they were talking to Maddie, the only non-white juror in the case whose story I also tell in the book. So that really needed to be explained. It could have been. I, I explained in the book how you have a witness explain something like that and, and minimize it, take the punch out of it. Um, but the prosecution failed to do that. And so the defense jumped on that in Rachel's cross-examination. You're making this racial. You're making this racial, aren't you? And Rachel Gentile was the only person in that courtroom who had the guts to say, yeah, this was racial. It was. Had she been prepared, I think she could have also explained, yeah, he was being followed because of his skin color, as so often happens, happens to young African-American males. And you know what, Don West, you keep comparing him to a burglar. Why are you doing that? Why are you saying that he's a match to the burglars in the neighborhood? The only match is skin color. You're the one making it racial. She could have done that. She could have done that very effectively, but that was another opportunity that was missed in the case. I think uh, I think one of the main themes here, obviously, is that the prosecution bungled the case. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, yeah, the prosecution bungled yes. the case. And um, uh, I want to kind of go back a little bit and and discuss, you know, the the root and the origin of why you think and why you've explained in the book why the prosecution fumbled the case. Um, it, it seems clear to you, to us, that th they didn't really want to take the case in the first place. I mean, law enforcement in the first, uh, law enforcement took, I think, took 44 days mm -hmm. to investigate the case, um, decided that they wouldn't be able to bring charges and, or decided not to bring charges, they wouldn't be successful. Um, Florida governor, under uh, much public scrutiny, uh, decided to appoint special prosecutor Angela Corey uh, to review the case, and then she brought charges. And so already the case was kind of forced upon upon the prosecution can can you discuss that a bit further and, and, and what you what you felt um this meant for the prosecution and how it guided the entirety of their case so you're absolutely right mm -hmm. uh this is not a case that they ever wanted to take to trial they didn't even want to arrest george zimmerman and remember when the police arrived he's standing there with literally with the smoking gun in hand mm -hmm. and trayvon martin is there deceased on the ground so there was no question immediately who had shot and killed this unarmed teenager mm -hmm. so why did it take 45 days for an arrest to be made that's what trayvon's parents wanted to know and they demanded an arrest when it wasn't forthcoming they galvanized the community mm -hmm. through their attorneys, uh, using the press very effectively, and I, I tell that story in the book, too. Ultimately, an arrest was made. But the very I, sad thing is that, you know, we the people got that arrest, but we couldn't get inside the attorney's offices right. and get them to prepare the case and get them to believe in the case and get them to believe that Trayvon Martin was truly the victim. So ultimately, they only did sort of a half-hearted job in the case. A lot of people who read my book, Suspicion Nation, believe that the prosecution intentionally threw the case, right? And that's a question I get a lot. Did they blow it or throw it, right? Um, I leave that to my reader to decide after reading all the stories in the book and all the facts. Um, I will say that Angela Corey, the lead prosecutor right after the case was over, smiled 
for the cameras and said the system worked, which I don't know if either of you would say that right after you lose a case. It's a very strange thing to say. Only one of the four prosecutors said he was disappointed with the verdict. Mm -hmm. um, there are people behind the scenes who say they never believed in the case. But you know, this leads me to the second half of my book, which are the root causes, because it's not just this case. Mm -hmm. As bad as this case was, there are so many others like it. Uh, Jordan Davis, Renisha McBride, Jonathan Farrell, Darius Simmons, unarmed young African Americans shot and killed by white shooters who are then exonerated or get only minimal uh, sentences or accountability. So why does this keep happening? And I think one of the most important things that I learned in covering this case is how widespread racial profiling is, not only in the community and among the police, but inside the criminal justice system. Right. How there's a real lack of belief that an African American like Trayvon Martin can be a victim, mm -hmm. can be an innocent victim. Um, and that's just a heartbreak. That's something that we have to change. Uh, throughout the criminal justice system, African Americans are treated so differently. It's such an advantage to show up with white skin, whether in the arrest phase, sentencing, uh, all the way through the criminal justice system. That's something that we all have to change if we really want to be the egalitarian nation that I think we do strive to be. Lisa, I want to read a quote from To Kill a Mockingbird that you included in the beginning of talking about the implicit racial bias. Uh, a quote that was written decades ago, but that unfortunately still rings true. Uh, it is, quote, in our courts, when it's a white man's word against a black man's, the white man always wins. They're ugly, but those are the facts of life. The one place where a man ought to get a square deal is a courtroom, be he any color of the rainbow. But people have a way of carrying their resentments right into a jury box. Yeah. So Lisa, tell me about the racial makeup of the jury and how you think that had an impact on the George Zimmerman trial. Yes, and you know that quote was so powerful to me as well. And, and before I get to the jury, I mean, we know, for example, that African Americans are arrested and convicted of marijuana possession at four times the rate of whites, even though the groups use at about the same number. Uh, you know, our prisons are just filled with African Americans who have been racially profiled, whose communities are disproportionately policed. Uh, and in a culture of mass incarceration, I mean, this is just unacceptable. To go to the jury, uh, we also know that African Americans are underrepresented on juries. Why? Because we have laws that prevent felons from serving on juries. So once certain communities, like African Americans, are disproportionately policed, arrested, convicted, and incarcerated, they're then prevented from serving on juries when they get out, even if it's, for, for example, for a marijuana possession conviction that's 20 years old. So it was no surprise to me that this jury was disproportionately white because that's the case for most juries. And that was the case here. So there were six jurors, which is unusual. That's how Florida does it in most cases. They all happened to be women. And there were five white women. And then there was Maddie, who's Puerto Rican slash African American. And I, tell, I open the book with Maddie's story, uh, which is it's a really shocking story of a woman who uh, had no experience with the legal system. She was a nurse's aide, mother of six, and uh, she tells a story of being demeaned and mocked and belittled by the five white women all the way through the case. They were all sequestered together in a hotel for three and a half weeks. She was made fun of constantly. They teased her for the way she talks. She was the only one who had a sheriff's deputy stationed outside of her hotel room door. She had to wonder, you know, is that because of my skin color or is that because I'm stationed at the end of the hallway? She was not permitted to see her baby uh, for a long weekend day that she requested, even though one of the white jurors got to see her dog for the entire day. You know, so she just felt constantly that she was being treated differently. And she felt very alone and isolated. Um, we know, by the way, from a lot of psychological studies about tokens, that if you're the only person of color in a group, how very emotionally draining that is. If you're the only woman, if you're the only gay person, um, it can be very, very difficult in a way that's often hard for the majority to understand. Mm -hmm. You know, some people say, why didn't Maddie just stand up for, for herself? If only it were that easy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. if only it were that easy. And so I try to uh, tell a more complex story of, of what, what she went through so that we can have some compassion for her. You know, ultimately, I don't blame the jury. I blame the professionals, the prosecutors in the courtroom for failing to do their job. I, the four out of the six wanted to convict George Zimmerman, we know now, when they started deliberations. But those four didn't have the facts and the law to stand for what they felt in their hearts. And so ultimately, the strong voices for acquittal were able to persuade them of their side. I think if the prosecution had done just the average, you know, C-level job, uh, they would have gotten the conviction because those four really believed that there was something wrong here. 
so what letter grade are you giving the prosecution <laughs> in the George Zimmerman uh, case? I give them an F. I really do. And I wouldn't have said that before I did the entire investigation. Because, for example, I've prepared some witnesses. They get up on the stand and they don't do what I said, right? Human beings are going to do what they're going to mm -hmm. do. So I couldn't blame the prosecution until I had all of the information. But when I found out that they almost completely failed to prepare Rachel Gentel, or the medical examiner who was so important and who had scientific testimony he wanted to present but was not allowed to present by the prosecution. Uh, even after the defense expert, Vincent DeMaio, did a very strong presentation, they could have called Dr. Bao on rebuttal to respond. They didn't. So, you know, now that I know what the facts are, I, I'd have to give them enough. And sorry, one other point about the prosecution's missteps. You mentioned not preparing the witnesses. You mentioned, you know, bungling the medical experts. The 911 calls prior to him, George Zimmerman, meeting with Trayvon Martin that night or interacting with Trayvon Martin that night could have played a key role in the case. There were many, yes. several times where George Zimmerman called to report men of black color, you know, in the neighborhood and yes. his suspicions. And those, if those had been played, you argue, would have shown his own, you know, inflated racial prejudice. So why weren't those played? Right. And, and that's something I talk about in the book as well, because that was pretty strong evidence of racial bias. And I remember when that evidence came in, I thought, aha, now they're going to argue it. But they never did. And I was just astounded. And again, when the trial was over, I went back and reviewed the entire trial. You know, did I miss something? Because they had this evidence. Did they argue it? You know, some point where maybe I looked away for a minute or is, I mean, no, they didn't. So what you're referring to is there were audio recordings of George Zimmerman's prior calls over the six months prior to this incident. And every Every call he made about a suspicious person in the neighborhood was about an African-American male. One hundred percent. Now, I've been a civil rights lawyer for many, many years. You don't often get evidence that good. If you have it, you should argue it. And, you know, by the way, we saw this again in the uh, Jordan Davis case. Michael Dunn was the shooter, what's called the loud music murder trial. Same two prosecutors, same mistakes, uh, and the outcome also not good. That was a hung jury in that case. They had explicitly racist letters written behind bars by Michael Dunn. He said, the more I get to know those people, referring to African Americans, the more prejudiced I am. He said, more people should shoot to kill young black males. We'd be a safer place. Okay, if you have letters like that, I mean, that is golden yeah. if you're at the prosecution. You should be cramming that down his throat, pardon my language, during cross-examination. You should be trying to get it in with every possible witness that arguably this could be relevant to. And certainly in closing argument, you should be blowing it up. You should be going slowly, word by word, showing the jury the kind of mentality of this guy because you're trying to prove a hostile intent. You're trying to prove ill will, hatred, or malice. You've got it in letters, and you don't argue it. That's the squeamishness about race that we saw in the Trayvon Martin case. The prosecution's just discomfort with the issue and refusal to go there, even when they had powerful evidence. But do you think some of that powerful evidence they couldn't show because George Zimmerman never took the stand? Was that an issue or a barrier for the prosecution? Well, well, first of all, the reason why he didn't take the stand was because of more mistakes made by the prosecution. They put in so many statements that he had given that he had now no reason to take the stand. Why would he? Why would any decent defense attorney put him on? Now the jury's heard everything he has to say without being subjected to cross-examination. That's perfect from the defense point of view. Mm -hmm. So the prosecution should never have put all of those statements in. Having said that, they did have the evidence in. They fought to get this evidence in uh, of the prior calls, all of them about black males, but then they never argued it. So it was this very strange disconnect, and y you had to ask yourself, what's going on? Well, we found out when the case was over because Angela Corey said, uh, we did our job. We put all of the evidence out there, and American, America can decide whether George Zimmerman is guilty of murder or not. Well, I'm sorry, that's not actually your job as a prosecutor. You're not a documentary filmmaker. You're not a journalist. Your job isn't just to put it all out there and let people take a look. Your job is to connect the facts and the law and give the jury a roadmap to conviction and to argue zealously uh, for your position that George Zimmerman is guilty of murder or manslaughter. That's what they failed to do. Well, to your point about not being a documentary filmmaker, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on 
the role that television played mm -hmm. in this um, in in this trial. And uh, you know, I think you touched on the opening statements of the prosecution and of the defense. Um, I think Don West, his he opened his uh, and he was uh, Zimmerman's attorney. Uh, he opened his uh, statements with a knock knock joke. Uh, I think the, the joke was something to the extent of uh, knock knock, who's there? George Zimmerman. Who like George Zimmerman? Who? Oh, hey, welcome. You're now on the jury. Right. Um, and 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 then uh, the and then silence. Right. And, and then silence. silence. Yes. <laughs> Obviously, didn't play very well, or maybe there was confusion. I I, I don't know. And then and then the um, prosecution opened with um, very explosive statements from uh, George Zimmerman dropping f bombs here and there. Is it? Do you think that this was something that was done for TV? Um, or, uh, do, or did TV guide it? This is something that they mm -hmm. would have they would have opened uh, uh, opening statements with uh, it had televisions not been in the courtroom. You know that might be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I talk in the book about mm -hmm. the jury's perspective on that. I think because I think we uh, television legal analysts we all seized on that. Right, the joke was so inappropriate, so insensitive right. with Trayvon Martin's parents sitting just mm -hmm. a few feet away, and then the prosecution beginning with the profanity mm -hmm. that George Zimmerman had started out with these effing punks. They mm -hmm. always get away, and. Uh, you know, my perspective, because I watched the entire trial, a lot of commentators just watched little snippets or read summaries, was, uh, yeah, the joke was terrible, um, but really the, pro the prosecution uh, won probably on style points. They had this kind of dramatic, very short opening statement, but the defense won on substance. They, mm -hmm. after that joke was over, Don West went on for almost, I think, almost two hours and really went through the evidence bit by bit that they had on their side. You know, a trial is about evidence. It's not about a one-liner. Mm -hmm. So we in the media, I think, seized on that. But inside the jury room, we know from Maddie, first of all, she didn't get the joke. She thought, what? I, I don't understand. She was trying to still figure out who George Zimmerman was. She mm -hmm. didn't know who he was. She just moved from Chicago. She didn't watch the news. She was unfamiliar. She didn't know if he was one of the lawyers. She was unclear. The profanity really startled her. You know, here I am in the solemnity of the courtroom, and this guy is using this language. Why is he saying that? And then, you know, sometimes somebody says something that throws you off, and then you miss the next few things that they say. I've been there so, before. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so then she missed that, oh, he's saying that George Zimmerman said right. that. So she was really kind of thrown by the whole thing, mm -hmm. an opening statement. I want to ask you about a very controversial topic ever since George Zimmerman was arrested the stand your ground defense and how that exactly played a role in the trial because there was some confusion as to how it truly did impact the verdict given that he didn't tradition he didn't really use the defense of stand your ground but uh some people say stand your ground as a law still impacted that verdict can you explain that yes it is very confusing so in in the zimmerman case stand your ground was part of the case and then it wasn't and then it was so let me explain that so i think part of the reason why george zimmerman was not arrested for 45 days is because of stand your ground so the police said you know we'd like to arrest him but we can't because stand your ground is a law in florida that gives him so many rights and he had the right to stand his ground and shoot in self-defense, and we don't really have any evidence to refute that. And uh, I think that is in part true. Stand your ground does make it more difficult for police and prosecutors, which is why most of them oppose the law that's now here in half the states. And for people who aren't familiar with stand your ground, stand your ground changes the prior law. The prior law was if you're in a violent confrontation on the street and you can get out of there safely, you have a duty to retreat, which I think only makes sense because there's a lot of confusion in these situations and somebody might shoot in self-defense. Later on, turns out it wasn't self-defense. You can't bring somebody's life back. So the idea was to de-escalate, to encourage nonviolence. Well, Stand Your Ground changes that. People now no longer have an obligation to retreat. If you're threatened on the street, in a car, in a parking lot, in an office, wherever you are out in the world, you can pull a gun and shoot in self-defense. And that's true in Florida and half the states. Uh, now, I want to add, though, that you still have an obligation to be in reasonable fear of imminent great bodily injury or death. So I can't just say, oh, you're making me nervous, you're looking at me funny, I'm going to take out a gun and shoot you. Mm -hmm. You also can't just be in an ordinary fist fight and take out a gun and shoot. You have to be in reasonable fear for your life, okay? So George Zimmerman was not arrested because of Stand Your Ground. Then the trial was coming up. He had the right to a stand your ground pretrial hearing. If he had taken that uh, advantage of that opportunity, he could have been exonerated. He did not. His attorney said, no, we don't want that. So then they went to trial. Many people thought at that point, okay, stand your ground is no longer part of the case. But that's not true because it's in the standard jury instructions. So 
The self-defense jury instruction that the judge gave to the jurors was George Zimmerman had the right to stand his ground. And she read that to them. They took that into the deliberation room. They read it. After the acquittal, one of the jurors said George Zimmerman had the right to stand his ground. So it definitely was part of the case. And I would say also just more broadly, sort of the 30,000 foot view, most people in Florida understand stand your ground uh, in a very broad, too broad sense of I have the right to fight back if I feel threatened and even pull a gun and shoot, which as I just explained is not actually the law, even with stand your ground. But that's what people think. He had the right. The, he, if somebody was, was assaulting him, he had the right. You know, the, the real poignant issue to me is I think Trayvon Martin is the one who was standing his ground. He felt that he was being followed. Uh, Rachel Gentel heard the beginning of the incident, which was Trayvon Martin said, why are you following me? Which is a perfectly appropriate question. Zimmerman said, what are you doing here? Which is really not appropriate. She then heard the sound of thumping on Trayvon's uh, chest, which was probably the, the wire to his phone uh, as George Zimmerman was shoving him or hitting him. She then heard the sound of wet grass and Trayvon Martin saying, get off, get off which are defensive words. So I believe that what happened was Trayvon Martin got one good punch in to George Zimmerman's face, which explains why his nose was punched in a little bit. Um, I think he was standing his ground trying to defend himself. And I think George Zimmerman took the gun out very early in the altercation because he was afraid because he had no fighting skills. He knew he couldn't take him on physically. He took the gun out and then he got afraid and he got angry when he got punched in the nose and that's when he shot him. That's what I believe happened. Man, your, uh, your, your book is full of gems, and you've just given us so much information right now. Thank you for that. Um, I'd be curious to know, and I think a lot of the, the uh, readers and listeners today will um, would be interested to know, what was the thing that surprise, will surprise the most about your discoveries? Uh, I mean, there's so many things that, that came up for me. I mean, the, the discussion at the beginning of the book regarding Maddie, the only juror of color, was fascinating. Her life and, and, and how when the book went to press, uh, I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, she, her husband, husband, her seven children are homeless, staying yes, with a friend. They still and are. Still are. And, uh, and, and, and her story and how she uh, was felt, uh, made to feel like uh, she was less intelligent, didn't understand the law, uh, just the depth of her confusion about the whole process. I found that to be fascinating. But what do you think that people will find to be the most surprising discovery? Well, a lot of people have been surprised about Maddie, and I suppose bigger picture, um, you know, all of the information I have about race and racial bias in mm -hmm. our criminal justice system. And, you know, Martin Luther King said in his final speech before he was assassinated, all we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. And we have these wonderful lofty promises in our Constitution and in our laws, but we are not there. And mm -hmm. when it comes to the criminal justice system, we're not even close. Uh, you know, as the 12 steppers say, the first step is acknowledging that you have a problem. Right. And we clearly have a problem. And sweeping it under the rug and not talking about it does not work, just mm -hmm. like it doesn't work for any other problem <laughs> that anybody has ever had. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to talk about it. We can't leave a segment of our population behind. We can't have a criminal justice system that treats them so differently. Uh, maybe one of the most surprising things is the discussion in the book about implicit racial bias, because mm -hmm. that was new to me. And many people are not aware that there's a whole field of study where we examine the issue of how is it that nobody will acknowledge being racist today, right? If, you, if I go speak to a group and I say, who here is racist? No one's going to raise their hand because nobody wants to be racist. And most of us think we're not. Most of us think we're colorblind. But yet the outcomes are so racially disparate. So how is that possible? Well, the answer is because of implicit racial biases, biases that we carry around uh, sort of subconsciously that we don't even know we have or we don't like to admit to. But there's no question that we have them. There's a, a cheat-proof test that you can take online mm -hmm. called the Implicit Racial Bias Test developed by Harvard University researchers. And it turns out 80% of white people in America have moderate or severe racial bias against African Americans. And so do 50% of African Americans, which is very disturbing. Mm -hmm. And when I speak to black groups, everybody goes, oh, yeah, uh-huh, like they're very aware. And when I speak to white groups, they say, what? I, you know, people are <laughs> shocked <laughs> to learn this. So... I try to talk very inclusively about race. I think it's very easy to demonize George Zimmerman, and he should be demonized, but it's much more difficult for all of us to look within and to think, how are we contributing to the problem? Where are our blind spots? And what we can do, what can we do to contribute to the solution? Uh, I think we have to talk about race in our homes, in our families, in our schools, and certainly in the criminal justice system if we're ever going to overcome this problem. 
You mentioned at the top of the show two upcoming trials, trials that uh, we have been covering up until, you know, the charging point, uh, Renisha McBride mm -hmm. and Jonathan Farrell. Two similar cases in that both of them are people of color. They got into car accidents. They went to, you know, a nearby home for help. In one of them, the person in the home called 911, and the cop, Randall Carrick, shot him, shot yeah. Jonathan Farrell. In right. the other one, Renisha McBride went to the door and the person at the other end of the door shot her. So Through a locked screen door. Yes, so. God help me if I ever get into a car accident. <laughs> <laughs> sad, really sad. Yeah, and uh, the question I have is, you know, you talk about the solutions. So, what lessons can be learned from the George Zimmerman trial, and what should the prosecutors in these upcoming cases, the cases of Jonathan Farrell and Renisha McBride, what should they do to get a different verdict than what we keep seeing over and over again with George Zimmerman, with Jordan Davis? What, what can we change? Well, one lesson is that they have to be uh, comfortable talking about race. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned in writing this book is how uncomfortable so many people of all different colors are talking about race. Uh, but we have to talk about it, especially when it's present. And look, these are murder trials. We could talk about blood and guts and gore and all kinds of very difficult, unpleasant things. We can talk about race. I try civil rights cases of race discrimination, sometimes to all white or mostly white juries, and I get a good outcome for my clients. Why? Because I'm comfortable talking about race. If you appeal to people's better natures, you can do it. I mean, this is really something that can be done. But I would also take a step back again and look at the bigger issue. I call the book Suspicion Nation because suspicions are what underlie the Jonathan Farrell case, the Renisha McBride case, Trayvon Martin, so many of these cases. Why are we all so suspicious of our neighbors, and in particular, people of color? It's time to get past that. It's time to get past these stereotypes of the black male as criminal, which began in the slavery era and continued through Jim Crow to the present day. This is a tired, old, toxic lie in America, and we have to get past it. And I call the book Suspicion Nation because many people have said to me, oh, Florida is terrible. It's not just Florida, folks. This is a nationwide problem. Uh, racial profiling was rampant in New York City, for example. Four million black and brown young men have been racially profiled in the last decade there. It's only just now being stopped by Mayor de Blasio, who ran on a campaign against racial profiling. Very common here in Los Angeles. This is a nationwide problem. Those two cases that you talk about are, I think, North Carolina and Wisconsin. So. We have to get past our suspicions and our fears. And by the way, even taking a step back from race, just to our fears of crime are so overblown. Crime is down to 1960s levels in America. Crime is way, way down. We have to stop being so paranoid. You know, we cover, you and I, we cover these high profile cases and maybe that makes people a little afraid that crime is everywhere, but it really isn't. And I go through in the book, the top 10 causes of death for Americans. You know, homicide is not even on that list. Number one cause of death is heart disease. So if you want to fear America's most prolific killer, fear cheeseburgers, <laughs> right? <laughs> we do far better looking at what we're putting into our bodies, uh, whether our homes are, are slippery or uneven surfaces because accidents in the home is a big cause of death, rather than looking outward at our neighbors mm -hmm. and being afraid of them because of skin color. That would serve us far better. Well, Lisa, I think we've learned a lot today uh, and a lot from your book. So I really encourage anyone who hasn't read it to pick up Suspicion Nation uh, in bookstores and online. And uh, Lisa, if any viewers want to get in touch with you and ask you questions about the book, how can they reach you? So I love that. I love hearing from my readers. It's just an author's dream. Uh, I'm very active on Twitter, Lisa Bloom. I'm very active on Facebook, Lisa Bloom Author. Uh, my website is lisabloom.com. You sense a theme? <laughs> it's Lisa Bloom. It's very easy. And, um, you know, I really, I really enjoy hearing from people, especially on Twitter or Facebook. And the book is available everywhere on all platforms, ebook, Kindle, Nook, etc. I read the audio book for people who like that. So I really hope people will get a chance to, to read it or listen to it. 
Well, thank you so much. And uh, we have some great guests coming up in the next couple weeks. We have Carl Douglas, mm -hmm. one of O.J. Simpson's uh, defense attorneys. He's going to come in to discuss, you know, we're approaching the 20th anniversary of his case. It'll be fascinating. Mark Garagos, Chris Brown's attorney, will be joining us. So be sure to stay tuned. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, we will be off next week, but back May 2nd. Again, Lisa, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Pick up her book. It's a fantastic read. Uh, we will see you all in uh, two weeks. Have a great weekend. Thank you. From producers Maria Menounos, Dario Kristen, Tiana Hobson, Kevin Undergaro, and the entire BHL crew, we would like to thank you for supporting Black Hollywood Live, the first online broadcast network dedicated to African-American entertainment. For questions and comments, contact us at info at blackhollywoodlive.com. Like us on Facebook, tweet us, or Instagram us at BHL Online. And I'm your BHL announcer, Scipio. Instagram me at Planet Scipio. Thank you for tuning in. The views expressed here are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals. Thanks for watching Black Hollywood Live on YouTube. For more in depth interviews and news, subscribe to our channel here and be sure to share your opinion in the comment section below here. See you soon, everyone. Bye.